Hello and welcome to Cricket World. I'm David Gower. It's extraordinary what having travelling fans does for a team. I mean, over the last 10, 20 years, England have been very lucky because this great band of people, the Barmy Army as they're called, have travelled with them and supported them. And that all started with just two or three guys on a tour of Australia all those years ago, selling a couple of t-shirts to fund their travel from Adelaide to Perth to go and watch the final test of the series. And it's grown to this, you know, possibly you know, 20,000 people watching England away at the same time. And it gives the players a, an unbelievable boost, I can tell you. It's the first time we've seen back-to-back -back ashes. Um, the good news for England fans, and England players actually, of course, is that we look strong, we look stronger than Australia. So we like to think that England has a great chance of winning both series, home and away. Um, it's unusual because what's happened is the World Cup is coming up in Australia in two winters' time. And rather than have an Ashes series and a World Cup on the same winter, they've split the winters up, so done one first and then the other. But when we get down there, the great thing, I mean, I've always loved, I have to say, I've always loved going to Australia from the first days I went there as a, a young man of about 20 playing cricket in Perth uh, to touring down there for England and now touring as a broadcaster. It's a fabulous country. And if we're down there for, say, two, three months, you know, there is so much to do. Um, I have a, an affection for the West because that's where I first started. You know, WA is where I played my first cricket in Australia for four, week, for four months. I uh, got to know a lot of people there, got to know the beaches, got to know the scenery, uh, got to know the city, the bars, the restaurants. I mean, it's a lovely place to be. And then the, the Australian experience as a whole. Um, I always say to people, you know, go down to Australia. If you're a cricket fan, go down there, enjoy the travel, enjoy the experience, and then add the cricket in. Uh, rather than the other way around, because I think there's so much going on all around this vast country that it would be such a shame to miss out on, on any of it, really. I always say to people, never underestimate Australian sport, and Australian cricket, of course, in particular. At the moment, it looks as though England are stronger uh, in pretty much every department. You know, man for man, you'd say England are, have better players and therefore are a better team. But any underdog, whether it be you know, from Australia or any other part of the world, likes to think it can fight back. And I think Australians have such pride in their sports, such a strong sporting culture, that as a team they'll want to come together. Um, there is an effect normally when you get a new coach, for instance, that you know, teams come together and say, right, let's support the new bloke. Uh, and Darren Lehman, who is the new coach, is a no-nonsense sort of cricketer, no-nonsense sort of coach, will be very empathetic with these players. And I guess if anyone can drive them upwards, it could well be him. I think England just have to say, right, we are likely to win this because we are better, um, but take nothing for granted. And knowing the England management, they will take nothing for granted. I think the two bowling attacks are reasonably well matched, but again, I think England has a, a stronger attack for our conditions. And the one reason that England are notably strong, you've got people like Jimmy Anderson, who is the best swing bowler in the world, Stuart Board, great, Bre uh, Bresnan or Finn. You know, these are all good, good, really good pace bowlers, but you've got such a good spinner. Graham Swan is the trump card in terms of if the ball turns at any stage in these five matches, he will be the man to take advantage. And Australia don't have a, a really good spinner. They've got some good seamers, so the, the bowling, I think, is the, the balance there is tilted by Graham Swan. So England have bowlers for all conditions. And if you look at the batting, you know, we've got players, really good players, great players, who are in form, making runs, you know, from Alistair Cook downwards, um, with Kevin Peterson coming back in, um, I think there's a really strong batting line. You know, Jonathan Trott has been so consistent. Uh, you know, if we don't make enough runs, I will be very, very surprised. If you look at someone like Kevin Peterson, I mean, you've got a genius there. Uh, you know, he is not an ordinary cricketer in any sense. And he's the sort of cricketer, as we've seen over the years, we saw it last winter in India, who can single-handedly change a game, can single-handedly win you matches. And the fact that he's fit again, and apparently untroubled by this knee problem he's had, the fact that he's started um, making runs in big quantities as soon as he's got back at the crease, I think is great for England because he can, he can change a series. He can turn a series. He can win you one or two matches. And out of five, that's brilliant. Yeah, I reckon both teams will take it game by game. I think both teams, for instance, want to say, Trent Bridge, which is the first test match of the home series, you're right, we need to hit the ground running uh, from ball one of that test match, try and get the advantage. I think England certainly will say that Australia will do their best to do that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's quite a long haul, but you'll take one series first, then the other. Um, but it's a long haul over 10 test matches. So again, there's already a strong feeling that the squad with the greater depth will still be coming first at the end of it all. So by the time we've finished 
in England in August. You know, by the time we get down to Australia in November, December, and finish up in the new year at the SCG, you know, it might be a question in some cases of who's still standing. But cricketers are, are fit. You know, they're really fit animals nowadays. I mean, they train that much harder than they ever used to. Um, you look at them, they are really fit athletes. Um, but yes, something like a, a, a five-match series followed by yet another five-match series does put a lot of strain on especially the bowlers. So the depth, maybe the depth of the squads is going to be uh, important as well. My first Ashes series was 1978-79 uh, in Australia. Um, the first winter back after playing grade cricket in Perth uh, that previous winter. And it wasn't quite the full-strength Australia team, so we'd actually, we had a, a slightly easier ride than it might have been, but there was some really good cricket player. I made 100 in the second test of that series at Perth, uh, which is one reason the Wacker has been one of my favourite grounds of all time. I made hundreds there again actually later on. Um, but that's always a special moment. First Ashes 100, given the history of the Ashes, you know, given everything that's gone before and given all the great names that have been part of Ashes series. Uh, and I was lucky actually because over the years I seem to bring some of my best cricket out in front of those spectators for Ashes series both in Australia and at home here in the UK. And so a lot of my favourite memories come from Ashes series. Captioning England to victory in 85 was special. Uh, and equally so, losing again four years later uh, was a bit of a black mark and was one of, sort of the, the personal tragedies, if you want to put it that way, of my career. Well, the most famous Ashes test I played in um, was the 1981 Headingley Test match, where we were coming second for most of it. Uh, in the good old days when there were rest days, so Saturday night we seemed out of the game, we had a day off Sunday, we had a massive party with Ian Botham um, in the wilds of the north, the north there somewhere where he used to, he used to live out at Epworth. Um, we had this big party, came back on Monday morning thinking, well, it's surely a matter of time, you know, in honesty, that before we lose this game. And as that game, as that day develops, and it was Ian, of course, who made, uh, an ex he played an extraordinary innings um, against all odds to get us back into the game, which took us into the final day, where Bob Willis uh, then took eight wickets and clinched the game. That was the most extraordinary turnaround and the most extraordinary test match I played in. Uh, and someone actually reminded me quite recently that I made a few runs in that game. I didn't make the contribution that Ian did. I didn't take the wickets that Bob did. There was no chance of that. Uh, but when you got such a close game, you know, 30 odd runs in the game actually could help make a difference. But just to be there was extraordinary. Well, I love being around Australia, out and about in Australia. It's an outdoor culture. Um, you can normally rely on the weather uh, around the country. And you know, my affection, a lot of my affection lies in the West after my early days there in Perth. And I know a lot about Perth. The beaches are gorgeous. Anywhere you want to go from Cottesloe up to City Beach, up to Scarborough. You've got a whole stretch of pristine beaches there, lovely waters, the Indian Ocean lapping at your feet. Um, you've got a, a nice bar and restaurant culture in Perth as well and you have across the whole of Australia. And this has all developed markedly over the years I've been going down there. It's changed, there's more wine than ever before. I'm a great fan of the vineyards. Again, in Perth, you've got the Swan River, you've got the Margaret River, and you've got some super wine all over the country. Um, and you've got these vast spaces. I mean, one of the things I did last time I was in Australia was went up to the Ningaloo Reef, two hour flight from Perth going north up that long coastline. And you have this gorgeous reef, which is uh, probably in better nick than, say, the Great Barrier Reef on the other side of the country. It's um, less overdeveloped, there are fewer people there, and you've got the most extraordinary marine life. If you go in May, I think, round about there, you get the, the whale sharks coming past and you can swim with them. Uh, no, don't worry, they're absolutely fine. They're enormous but very friendly and they're not going to eat you. Um, they like little things, they're sort of plankton eaters. Um, but you've got so much marine life. We went diving off the, the Navy Pier at Exmouth, um, I mean, it was a great experience. We stayed in this little eco camp called Sal Salis, where things like water are entirely rationed. And with two teenage girls who were thinking, for instance, when we first got there, you know, what have you got me into now, Dad? Within the first day they'd bought into it, and two or three days later when we had to leave, they didn't want to go. I mean, it was the most brilliant experience. Well, that's it, and thank you for watching us on Cricket World.